We're talking about the work of the local church tonight. And as I was looking at this lesson uh, this evening one more time, um, I got to thinking about back when I was uh, in the ninth grade, I took home economics. Now, back when I was a teenager, the boys took shop and the girls took home economics. But I thought about it and I said, where else can I be in a class full of good looking girls and only one guy, me? So I took home economics. <laughs> and one guy that was riding me pretty hard about it, I looked at him and I said, your girlfriend's in that class. And I am too, but you're not. <laughs> he got a little upset. Anyway, in that class, we had to sew a project. Um, and, and I chose to sew a vest. That was popular back then. You know, it was cool to wear your hippie vest. And... Uh, so I remember that mother took me down to the fabric store. I don't know if it was Joanne Fabrics, whatever one was open back when I was, you know, back in the dark ages. And uh, we picked out a pattern that had a, a style of vest that I thought was cool. And, and uh, we, you know, looked on the instructions that told us just exactly how many yards of fabric we needed to buy. And I think it was a reversible vest. So we had two different fabrics that we bought, you know, so you could make it two different vests and all and um, we did all of that and mother took me home you know and, and, and she showed me how to uh, lay the fa lay the pattern down on the cloth and there were as I remember there were two lines on the pattern there was one that was a cut line and you'd cut it all out and then the other was a sewing line and so we took straight pins and we pinned the pattern to the fabric and uh, and Grethel can probably tell you I'd do this a lot better than I can because I'm going on long memory. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we, we cut all of this fabric out. And we sewed it up, you know, right along the lines of the pattern and everything. And, and then it had instructions for how to leave a certain part of a corner, as I remember, unsewn so that you could actually reach in there and turn the thing inside out. Because you wanted the excess cloth from where you sewed it on the inside of the vest so it didn't show, you know, so it looked good. And uh, we got all of that done and I wound up with this rather hideous looking vest. But when I got through, it looked something like the picture on the front of the pattern. Um, I wasn't real pleased. I wore it a couple of times and then I just kind of, you know, it was my first effort and it looked like a first effort. But, uh, but we had a pattern is my point and to get the what was pictured on the front of that pattern package I had to follow the pattern and the instructions included in that pattern now if I was trying to make a pair of pants I would not have picked out that pattern because that was for a vest I would have picked out a pattern for a pair of pants I wasn't that uh, I forget the word I'm looking for I was, didn't want to do all of that much work because I figured it was not going to turn out real great anyway because this is my first shot at doing anything like that. But, uh, you know, some people will say, have accused me of being a pattern theologian to which I say guilty. Because God has given us a pattern. And that pattern is designed to make His assembly look like what he wants it to look like. When Moses brought the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, he brought them into a valley between two mountains, Mount Gerizim on one side and Mount Ebal on the other side. And the people stood and all day long they read the law to them. And from Mount Gerizim they read all of the blessings that would occur if they kept the law. And from Mount Ebal they read the curses that would occur if they did not keep the law, and all the people, when it was finished, said amen. And they uh, made a vow that they were going to hold to that pattern. And the pattern for God's people in the Old Testament was a physical kingdom. And he gave them all kinds of laws that said, do not move the ancient landmarks, these, these stones that have been set up to mark boundaries of territories, you do not move them. And, and, and these other things, you know, the, the, uh, 
There, there are rivers and things like that. And you need to leave those things alone because they're there to mark boundaries of territories that I have established. And you don't change those things. And so they had a pattern to follow. Now in the New Testament, that pattern has changed somewhat from the Old Testament. And we looked at Sunday morning the pattern that was used for the worship assemblies. And we said there are, and call them whatever you want to, I don't care. Five acts of worship is what I grew up calling them. Uh, you can call them five things we do in worship. You, you know, Some people have said, oh there are not five acts of worship. That's not a scriptural term. I don't care what you call them. They prayed. They sang. Without the use of instrumental music. They uh, observed the Lord's Supper. They took up collections. And they heard the word of God taught. Preaching. Those are the five things that they did in worship. Now notice some of the things they did not do. That were part of the pattern in the old law. They did not bring in sheep and goats and turtle doves and things like that. And sacrifice them in their worship service. Why? That was the pattern in the old law. But that pattern changed. And they did not do that under the new covenant that God had for his people as a collective item. Now, could they uh, kill a sheep or a goat? Sure they could. If they wanted to eat one individually, they could do that. Uh, Paul upbraided them in the Corinthian letter um, in 1 Corinthians 11 for how they were partaking of the Lord's Supper. And he said, you know, basically what they were doing was turning it into a common meal. Where they were just eating and, and in among the eating they might take the unleavened bread and the, and the fruit of the vine. I, I don't know exactly what, what they were doing. Because it doesn't actually specify. But it, it indicates that they were taking this thing entirely too lightly. And Paul said, what have you not houses to eat and drink in? Well, maybe they were worshiping in a house. It wasn't the physical place, it wasn't this building that Paul was talking about in that local congregation that was the problem. Um, I brought some uh, chicken nuggets in here for Ruth to eat because she didn't have supper before she came to church tonight. And I was just down the street, I had a call over here in, in Treasure Island before I came to, to services. So I ate dinner at, at KFC and she asked me to get her something so she could... Uh, assuage her hunger before services started. And she ate them here in the building. Well, nothing wrong with that. But doing that as part of the Lord's Supper, there's a big problem there. Now, and I'm going to throw this in as an extra. I'm not going to charge extra for this. But there is a group known as the House Church Movement among the people of God that call themselves Church of Christ today and there's a group in Tampa that I know, and they will deny it, but I know that they eat a common meal around a big long table and they eat their food and in the course of eating that meal they partake of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine and they do it in that very casual manner like Paul condemned the Corinthian church for doing. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, there is. It's not according to the pattern that we were given for the Lord's Supper. Jesus gave us a pattern for how we ought to partake of it. Corinthians doesn't particularly give us a specific pattern, but we need to do it like the pattern that we're given because, you know, if Paul in Corinthian, in, in, to the Corinthian church had added to the pattern that Jesus gave and said, oh yeah, you can eat a meal and you can partake of this along with the meal, then yeah, we could do it either way. But we don't have that pattern. It's a consistent pattern that Paul gave to what Jesus gave. And we have to stay within what is revealed. We cannot go beyond that. And so when we're worshiping, the church as a collective unit, you know, I mean, we, we say, well, you know, where, where do you get the authority marked to open an air conditioning business? Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands that which is good that he may have to give to those who have need. I paraphrase that highly. Well, is fixing air conditioners a good thing? 
If your air conditioner is broken, I come to your house, you're going to think it's a good thing. Until I give you the bill, of course. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's a good thing. But should the church open up as a collective unit, as an assembly? Should it open an air conditioning business to fund the activities of this congregation? We have no authority. We have no pattern for the collective unit called the assembly, the ecclesia, to do that. And so we can't do that. So we have a pattern. We've got to stick within the pattern. And, and really, that's, that's what there is. And some people will want to. I, I got into a big argument, I remember, with my 10th grade English teacher. And she probably could have gotten in trouble for it way back then. But we were talking about religion. And she was just, you know, adamant that we could follow the old law. The old law was still in force. And I kept showing her passage after passage that showed that the old law had been done away with. And that we couldn't go by that pattern anymore. And, and, and we had a good discussion. I mean, I, you know, I always enjoy talking. I prefer to talk to people I disagree with usually because I learn more than I do talking to people I agree with. Um, and we all ought to, ought to be talking to people we disagree with because it sharpens us up. And it helps us to, to be able to, to solidify things in our own mind that maybe we've always believed, but you know, we say, you know, something about that that I need to study a little more. And that's always a good thing. But, uh, but at any rate, we, we just can't take that old covenant and set it to apply today because God changed the pattern. Simple as that. Now, when we look at what the New Testament church did and we look at the things that they were told not to do, we're not looking for only the prohibitions of Scripture. When Paul said... Uh, what have you not houses to eat and drink in? That didn't mean that we could only... Uh, I'm going to try and say. That we could only not eat a common meal and partake in the Lord's Supper. There are certain other things about the pattern of the Lord's Supper that we need to observe other than keeping commonality out of it. Um, you know, I think when Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, and then he passed it around to the disciples. I think that means that we need to ask God's blessing on the bread before we pass it around. Now, I'm not adamant that those words be used, but in some way we need to do that. And he took the cup and he blessed it. And I think in some way we need to ask God God's blessing upon the cup before we pass it around. Because that's what the pattern is. Um... And again, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you've got to use... You know, I've, I've known of some brethren that said, you've got to use these exact words when you pray for the bread or the cup. Uh-uh, I'm not going to say that. Because we don't know what words Jesus used to bless the bread and bless the cup. It just says he did it. That's as far as we go, because that's our pattern. All right. <clears throat> Another way to look at what God's pattern for us is, is to look at how the New Testament churches use their, raised and used their money. In raising their money, we see an absence of selling chicken dinners, of uh, mowing people's yards, of, of doing all kinds of things to earn money. And I remember uh, growing up when we lived in Gainesville, there was a Baptist church uh, around the corner from our house that was trying to get the money together to, to build a new church building. Their old one was, it was an old log building, believe it or not, back in the 1970s. They had a, a log cabin structure. It had probably been there since the early 1900s. And it was handmade. It was a beautiful building. I think it's still there, as a matter of fact. But anyway. But they needed a, a, a new building, and, a, and they wanted a larger building. And so they started selling chicken dinners every Saturday night. They would sell these, you know, get the plates and all that, and you go buy the, the uh, chicken dinner from them, take it home, eat it, or you could eat it there in the church building. Didn't matter to them. Well, uh, I do remember one time a famous Baptist preacher named Billy Sunday was asked by a man 
he said, uh, you know, we, we've been trying to raise money to build a new church building and we just can't seem to get it together. He said, we've tried chicken dinners, we've tried this, we've tried that, we've tried... And he said, you know, can you tell us anything else we might try? And Billy Sunday wrote back and said, try religion. <laughs> you know, I thought coming from a Baptist preacher, that was a pretty poignant answer. Try religion. If you need a new building, how do you raise the money to build it? Well, you do it the way the Lord said. You do it according to the pattern. And what is the pattern? Well, there's only one we've got. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says on the first day of the week when you're gathered together uh, to give as you have been prospered. And, you know, to take up that collection. Now, having a collection indicates, and I, we're not reading a lot of these scriptures because we've got too much ground to cover here tonight. Um, I want to finish this on time this quarter, <laughs> this series. So, but that, that's our pattern there and, and we don't have the pattern to do anything else to collect money. Now somebody will say, well, I don't believe there's a pattern in the scriptures for the church to have a treasury. And I've run into some people, I, you know, worshipped with a man at Seminole that adamantly maintained that was a collection for a specific purpose and it was because of a certain need the church had and we don't have any authority for a regular collection that puts money into a treasury. I said, Al... Paul said that there be no gatherings when I come. What does that indicate to you? That all the money was all over the place and had to be collected when he came? That everybody just put it in their own little kitty so they collected it all together? It said that there be no collections when I come. That was a treasury. That was a treasury. Can't be anything else. And he said lay by in store. Laying by in store means you're setting that money in a special place. That's called a treasury. That's what a treasury is. There's your authority for a treasury. Well now he was saying, well we should only be collecting money when the church has a need. Okay. I'll give you that. If the church doesn't have any need for money, then why should we be taking up a collection and storing it up into a treasury? A church that doesn't have a need for money is a church that's not doing much of anything. Especially in this day and time. Would, would you agree with that or not? We have a need to pay the light bill here. We have a need to buy teaching materials, to furnish to people, to teach the gospel. We have a need to pay our evangelists because God said the laborer is worthy of his hire. Should the church have a regular ongoing need to collect money? If not, you're going to have to convince me why. Uh, a, a church that doesn't have that need is a church that's just not doing much of anything. And you know, not doing what you know you ought to be doing is as much a sin as doing the wrong thing. So we need to be careful about that. Um, they use the money uh, in Acts chapter uh, 4 and 5 and so forth. Uh, they had all of these people, all of these Jews had gathered in Jerusalem. We talked about this, I think, Sunday morning a little bit. Uh, had gathered in Jerusalem and they heard the first gospel sermon and they became Christians. And I'm shortening this down, way down. But, and, and then they all stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't want to go back home. Because they had just figured out that there was a new pattern that God had established and they wanted to learn about this pattern. And so they stayed there where the apostles could continue to teach them. Well, a lot of them didn't have a job in Jerusalem. They left their jobs back in Bethlehem or wherever they came from. Some of them, I'm sure, from a lot farther away than that. But they stayed in Jerusalem and so they had a need. They were starving. And so those who had lands and houses and extra things came and sold them and laid the money at the apostles' feet. Another instance of a treasury. And they distributed to their fellow saints as each one had need. Well, when the persecution in Jerusalem arose, which caused them all to scatter, at the time God said, okay, you've stayed there long enough, you've learned enough, now get out and start teaching other people, God brought a persecution upon them. That ended the need 
for that particular collection, at least in as far as, as that scope went. Uh, because they all started heading back home. When they went home, they took the gospel with them. Now later on, uh, we see in Judea there was a famine. And uh, Paul told the Corinthian church that there was a collection being made of various congregations in Galatia and, and the Cor Corinth and places like that, that they were going to be sending money to the Judean brethren who needed some more help at this time. This was some 10 years or so, I think, after, seemed like it was 10 years, after the beginning of the church in Acts 2 that was talked about. And so they gathered up the money to send to their needy brethren far away. Well, what if we had, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, a mighty uh, hurricane came through the Philippines and just wiped out a lot of people over there. And a lot of brethren were hurt. They, their houses were knocked down and so on and so forth. And I remember uh, I was at Florida College at the time. And uh, the church that I was a member of, which was a 40th Street congregation, we took up a collection on the fifth, it was the fifth Sunday coming up. And we just decided, you know what, we're going to take this whole collection. And there are certain men that are take the money over there uh, that, you know, we can send it to through a bank and wire it to these men. And they'll make sure it gets to the saints that need it. And so we took up that fifth Sunday collection and we sent it over there. And I remember one girl, I was kind of interested in her up to that point in time, but she was adamant. This was the most unscriptural thing in the world. And the only reason she was adamant about this because we never did it before. Well, we never had that need come up before. But now it came up and it was exactly what was talked about in 1 Corinthians 16. I couldn't get her to see that, which was why I lost interest in her. I was kind of disgusted with her. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> that happened a lot at Florida College. You know, people would come and kids would come and we didn't do it like that back home. That's wrong. Um, we need to be careful about that. You know, like we did it back home ain't our pattern. What's our pattern is what's in the New Testament. They also uh, cared for widows indeed. Now, they didn't just take any widows. And start caring for them because Paul told them that, you know, told Timothy that, uh, you know, those who have widows of their own family need to take care of them and let not the church be charged. 1 Timothy 5. That the church may take care of widows indeed. And certain, a certain pattern was given for those that were widows indeed. And those ladies who did not have other means of support or family that could take care of them then were to be enrolled in the number, as it says, for the church <clears throat> to take care of their needs out of its treasury. These are the things we see done in the New Testament assembly, local assemblies um, that are to be done. Now, that passage in 1 Timothy chapter 5 shows us a very distinct difference between the members of the local assembly and what their responsibilities or pattern was as Christians and the pattern was for the assembly to act as an assembly. And we need to be very careful that we don't take things that God designed and said for individuals to do and try to apply it to the assembly because it just doesn't work that way. Um, question number two, before we go further. How does the pattern of the New Testament, uh, how does it teach us and I'm, I'm not saying just, you know, the things that teach, but how does it teach us? Why is it important that we follow that pattern, in other words? I think that's really what, what question two is. I think that's what Brother Turner is trying to get to. How does this tell us the work of the early churches? Why is it important that we follow that pattern? Anybody can think of a scripture to throw at me? I've, there's about three or four verses I can think of off the top of my head. Mm 
not the last two verses, but almost. Or are they? Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay, teachers. See, the teacher's not always right. I'm just a man. Read those for us. Oh, but that only applies to the book of Revelation. Do those specific words only apply to the book of Revelation? Specifically? Actually, that's, that's true. They only apply to Revelation. Some of you are looking at me like, huh? Because it says the words of this book. This book was not written. This book was not done as a book at that point in time. It has to be talking about the book of Revelation. Because that's the only book... <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> that was the only book that John was, was, had written and was referring to it that, with those specific words. Now... Does it apply to the rest of Scripture? Does the principle apply to the rest of Scripture? Well, how do we know that? Give me some other Scriptures. Second John 9. Second John 9. Yes, Second John 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? What about in the book of Jude? Um... Verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing you to you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. What about Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21? Anybody know that one off their head? Why call ye and and do not the things which I say. Cite it for us. So, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19 may specifically only apply to the book of Revelation. And that's true. I'll, I'll attest to that. But the principle that's written there was already stated before the writing of the book of Revelation and was asserted even back as far as Deuteronomy. When Moses told them, do not do anything that's not written in the words of God. Tom, you had something else? Okay, so I mean, you know, we can we can go to a whole bunch of scriptures to show that this this law of do not add to and do not take away from the word of God applies to the entirety of God's word, even though a specific word may only apply to a specific book. So, if anybody ever throws that back at you, that's the way to answer that. Um, and you know the well. Anyway, we can go to all kinds of passages to show that. There are many, many more. Um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That gives us a pattern. Gives us a pattern. Can we, uh, can we worship idols? 
Well, no, we find out that the, some of the seven churches were worshiping idols. And they're condemned for that. Well, it kind of gives us an idea that, hey, we can't go bringing statues and things like that in here and bow, bowing down before them. We can't be bringing a bunch of beads in here and start praying through them. Uh, not in the pattern. And we're told not to do anything else. And uh, those who broke the pattern were roundly condemned. And universally so. Um, two types of work, really. Uh, if, I mean, and, and this is a human designation that Brother Turner has come up with, but I think it's pretty good. There were two types of work that the local church engaged in. Local, excuse me, local assembly engaged in. The local ecclesia. And that was world work and self-maintenance work. Now let's talk about the self-maintenance work first. Do we have authority for church buildings? Yeah, but they assembled in an upper room, so we should always use an upper room. <laughs> I'm being ridiculous, of course. They assembled in an upper room. They assembled on a seashore underneath a tree. They assembled... Um, in people's houses. They assembled in, in various places. Sometimes we see them assembling in the synagogues that the Jews had built because the whole synagogue converted to Christianity in places. And so it became the meeting house for the Christians. And we see that throughout the New Testament. So we see them worshiping in all kinds of different places. Is there such a thing as general authority and such a thing as specific authority? Yeah. When we're not given a specific pattern. Now if the only place we ever see in the New Testament of Christians meeting to worship was on a seashore underneath a tree, a lot of folks in America would really be out of luck because there's only a certain amount of seashore around the edges of the country. But, uh, you know, we, that would be where we would have to meet because that's our pattern. But we don't see that. We see them meeting in all kinds of different places. When we see the apostles going into all of the world to preach the gospel, some of them walked, some of them rode chariots, some of them rode horseback, uh, some of them were actually carried by the uh, Roman guards as Paul was one time from one city to another because there were a bunch of Jews that had vowed to kill him. And he, being a Roman citizen, called upon the Roman garrison to protect him as he traveled to the next city. So we see all kinds of different modes of travel that they used. And so we can use any mode of travel that gets us to where we need to go, as long as it's honorable. Um, and, and that's the way the pattern works. Um, but the church <coughs> of the New Testament was primarily a spiritual institution. When it took up the physical needs of its members or members of foreign churches, that was not a regular thing that they did, but that was an extraordinary thing in each and every case. And so it's not incumbent upon us to have coffee and donuts sitting here when we come into the building. I just couldn't go for that because that's not the pattern. Now, if somebody is, if a member of the congregation is starving, I can see taking money out of the church's treasury and helping them out. But we don't see them do, doing that in the New Testament for everybody in the world. The, the church is not the world's benevolent organization. We don't see that pattern. Um, if it's there... It's never been shown to me. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'm, I'm always willing to look at something somebody shows me. Look at this scripture. Um, you think? Oh. Behold, I thought. 
What did Paul say? Behold, I thought to do many things against this cause. He thought he was doing the right thing, but he wasn't. So I, I get leery when I hear people say, I think that this passage applies to this. Let's look at the passage, Galatians chapter 6. And let's, again, let's look at it in its context in the pattern. Brethren, <clears throat> even if anyone is caught in any trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be too tempt, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. <clears throat> the one who is taught the word is to share in all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, am I right? Yeah. He will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due times we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good unto all people, especially to those of the household of faith. We've got to be careful when we take passages that are written to the assembly and applying them to the individual. If a widow is a widow indeed, who's to take care of her? Did Paul write Timothy? No. If a widow is a widow indeed, has that pattern that Paul wrote about, then she is to be enrolled in the number in the church. The assembly takes care of her. But if she is not a widow indeed, and she is a member of a family she is a family member of someone in the assembly who's to take care of her. She has to be. She has to qualify. Right. We're not talking about just letting somebody be lazy. And you know, if, if someone will not work, neither let them eat. And I think we can let them starve to death. Uh, I'm going a little bit over over there, but um, over what we're talking about there. But here he says he's talking about. A man, a man, a man, a man. The one who is taught in the word. And so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden we're taking do good unto all men. Oh, that's a church thing. It doesn't follow the context. Of chapter 6, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you will not be, you too will not be tempted. That's American standard. Or new American standard, rather. So that's an individual action. If I see a brother, it's my job to try to restore him. Well, any man. But in the context of what he's talking about, he's talking about our brethren in Christ here. I mean, when you look at the whole context, he's talking about the church interacting with each other as individuals. We see somebody, uh, and, and of course this, this principle, specifically here, is talking about members of the church. But the principle here, as we said before, when Jesus taught us we need to go into all the world, we need to, you know, we have all of these other scriptures, that principle applies to everybody we come in contact with. We need to be trying to bring in people to Christ. Our, our fallen away brethren as well as non-Christians. So just because Revelation 22 only applies to the book of Revelation doesn't mean the principle doesn't apply everywhere. Because here we have the same kind of principle going on. The same words are given to us in different words but talking about those that are outside the body of Christ. We need to restore them. And so... <coughs> When we are doing good, this is individual action here in the context. And, uh, and we need to follow the pattern. Um, really more one to talk about here. But, but the main thing here again, and we're out of time, so I'm going to quit.
And uh, Wayne will be speaking to us in just a couple of minutes. Look at the pattern.